G'day and welcome to part 53 on our XC Fairmont restoration and we've got that going pretty well now. We take it for a little drive up and down the driveway and do a few sort of drive over shots and stuff like that. Really just to see if the clutch is operating, if the brakes are operating and all that sort of stuff. Before I begin though, I want to talk about the electrics a little bit and a big shout out to Nick Sagliano Jr. because he's been sending me stuff and I want to go through some of that. Um, now, wiring is something that in a, in a car, in a simple car like a Falcon, or one of these Falcons, or you know, Sigmas, or MGs, or anything. Plymouth is another one. Um, I tend to mess around with the wiring quite a lot to get it the way I want it. Um, for example, uh, power feeds I might change. Things like um, the, in the case of the Plymouth, there was a couple of circuit breakers, and I wanted to put fuses in um, to make it a little bit more protected because the circuit breakers are very old, and there's only I think two or three in the whole car, and I wanted to put a full complement of fuses in. Um, things like that. So. The, the Falcon was another one, the ignition wiring, I changed all that over, the coil, the resistive wire in the coil, so I always ditched those and put a normal wire in. And it's always good to have some sort of diagnostic tools. Now, the, the main thing that people go for in their toolbox, or they have in their toolbox, is a test light. This is a snap-on one that I've had for 30 years. Um, I would have got this actually in the late 80s, I would think, and this is the go-to tool for a lot of people, particularly... Uh, great for things like fitting a tow bar, checking the powers, you know, the lights up and it's all good. But I actually tend not to use this that much. It's it's a very good tool and when I need it, I need it. But most of the go-to stuff for me involves a multimeter. And this is, I always use this particularly for continuity, for resistance, for voltages, all that sort of stuff. Um, if you're using, if you're doing a diagnosis on a VCR or something, and I'm showing my age, um, you would go to that because you're not going to just get a 12 volt um, test light because you don't know what the voltage is going to be. So, you know, a multimeter is the way to go for, for most of the stuff I do. Now, there's other little bits and pieces, LED testers, you know, if you're doing a circuit and you want to use an LED in it or whatever, and I have used them in cars as well, um, you can test, it, test the integrity with those to make sure it's working the way it should, particularly if it doesn't come on when you think it's going to, it might be blown, you can't tell when LEDs are blown, they don't blow up, they just don't work. Um, so they're good for that sort of thing. Little devices like this, which have a ZIF socket on them, and the battery voltage is a bit low. You can test all sorts, capacitors, all sorts of stuff with that as well. It's very simple. I haven't used this much, that's why it still looks fairly new. They're only cheap, they're on eBay, and they're pretty good. Um, the Plymouth was one, and the Falcons as well, where I used an ammeter, an inline ammeter, and you can hook up a wiper motor, or you can hook up a... Um, on a heater fan or whatever it is you're using, electric fan for the radiator, and you can see what the current drawer is with this and choose the wiring appropriate to the circuit you're doing. Um, but Nick sent me an oscilloscope a while ago, and this is good in that with a digital multimeter, you can see where power is, it comes up and it shows you the value and all that, but you can't see the quality of the power, you can't see if there's any interference or noise attached to it, but a little digital scope gives you the capability to see that. So you set it up, you, you get your waveform on there and you can see exactly what you've got, particularly if it's an analog signal, like a sine wave, and it's dependent on being a clean sine wave. Sometimes when wires are shielded or cables are shielded and the shielding fails, there's a lot of noise attached to it and stuff like that, which is undesirable. Great for amplifiers and bits and pieces like that. So you'd use that, um, things like the radio or tape player, if there's problems with that sort of thing. And I know the tape player in the XC needs some work done on it, it needs a belt and stuff like that. Um, I might also recap it, um, put, replace the capacitors, and certainly in the case of the Plymouth, and the Plymouth radio works, it's got tubes in it or valves in it, I'll change those out, and you know, most likely change out the capacitors as well, and I can test them with this sort of equipment. Now Nick also sent me this, and it's just come in the post today, this is a Mighty Vac, it's a vacuum set, and it's got absolutely everything, a nice little book of words on it, um, but also... It's got a reservoir attached, so I can use it for brake bleeding, and I think that's what prompted him to send it to me. He, uh, it was sent from Amazon. This is a great bit of kit. Now, any mechanic from the 80s would have seen these. Um, they're a very, a very, very good pump. They, uh, hang on, you can measure your vacuum, um, you can attach this, you can bleed brakes. There's a whole bunch of attachments that come with it in this kit, and I'm eternally grateful to Nick for that because this is all stuff I'll use. Now, particularly with this guy, I'll use this on the XD because I've got problems with the climate control on it, or the heater if you like, there's no air conditioning on the car, but a lot of the time 
um, if there's a problem with the switch, you'll pick it up with that. Um, instead of blindly just replacing vacuum motors on vents that are supposed to be moving, I can check those vacuum motors by just put, putting this on and pumping it up and seeing if the motor holds vacuum. That's got a gauge on it. It's absolutely perfect. So Nick, if you see this, thank you ever so much. It's absolutely wonderful. And I will get good use out of that. Now, these are the sorts of tools you don't use every day. Of all of them, the multimeter is the one that I always go to. Um, but certainly with these sorts of things, they're invaluable. Um, when you're like me and you've got a bunch of cars from different eras, they all require some sort of different tools to, to keep them running properly. Um, and the other thing I'll use this, <laughs> I just remembered, the um, pull-off diaphragm on the XC is absolutely munted, so I need to get a couple of new ones, but I can actually check that everything's working properly by hooking one of these guys up. So that is, that's come at a really, really great time. It's got a little Schrader release on it, so to speak, so you can just release the vacuum. Um, I can't see from where I am. You can just evacuate it that way if you don't want to do it by just pulling it up. So our XC Falcon is a running driving car. And it's pretty cool because I got on it the other day and, well, first of all, I took the distributor out, thought I'd reprime the pump. You don't really need to prime the pump in an internal oil pump engine. They just pick it up and they run with it. But I didn't want to crank it over without fresh oil because it hasn't run for a while. Um, so I did that. I got oil pressure, bang, straight away. And then, of course, I couldn't start it because we didn't have enough fuel in it. And not just that, I had the plugs reversed. And when I put the distributor back in, I put it in with too much advance. I marked it, but I didn't mark it very well. So she's running beautifully now. The only thing that I might ask for help with, if anyone knows, um, Sigma, when you go for reverse, you've actually got to push it across and down and up. The XC has got reverse in the same spot, being a single rail, but it just sort of falls over and goes up. Now, I've strengthened the spring on the shifter, but it's still, you can feel where it starts to go over, where the first gear, where the first gear gate is. But it's just too easy to get into reverse, and I don't know if that's normal or not. So if anyone has any single rails, please let me know. This box is, I'm sure, a close ratio XB GT box. The numbers came up as being that on the tag, but the tag, I think, was removable. Was it or not? No, it wasn't. It was stamped into the tail shaft housing. I won't really know, because that could just be a different um, tail shaft housing on that on that gearbox when you get to 50 years old with cars and particularly Fords and Holdens that have been messed around with a lot parts do tend to get interchanged so I would prefer in driving a wide ratio but if it's a close ratio that's fine that just gives it more of that GT power pack option integrity I guess so um, this is just quite a quick video there's not much in it at the end of the video there's a little bit of um, stuff I'm doing at school which might not interest the XC guys um, it's more about the stuff we're doing in systems with an electronic greenhouse and basically it's a 12 volt thing and some kids stuck it in the PowerPoint and it went bang and <laughs> I had to fix it. So anyway, I hope you enjoy. Sorry, I got overcome with a bit of rudeness. We also check in on Graham on how he's going with the guards for the XC. So now I hope you enjoy. I don't know if you can see down there the handbrake from the front cable hanging down. I had to... Um, Two sets of lever hardware, for want of a better term. There was that one off the... Or there was that one off this car, sorry, and there was one off the fairlane. The other thing is, I've tried the fairlane's handbrake cable and it actually fitted, but it's, got, it's sort of seized. And I'm just sort of finishing up under here. It's a bit of extra hardware, that... What is it? 7 16 nut. Um, the captive one had fallen off at some point in the past, so I just put that there. Um, handbrake has been an issue of conjecture there, so... Bracket there, and people sort of had that sort of in the wrong way. There's also this one here, under there. So all the handbrake stuff is good, except the cable. I'm going to get have to go and get another cable. But I think for now we're pretty good. The tail shafts strapped in with the right bolts and all that sort of stuff. But looking this, I, I think it's all good. Um, the car can go. Back on the ground, I think. That's cool. May have been wrong last time I started this. Um, I know I turned it over by hand, but I haven't actually started it. I came to the decision. So I'm going to pop that air cleaner off. Let's have a look in here for a minute. Yeah, I did put an element in. Um, and we'll just go th through it. And I'll 
pop the plugs out. There's a problem with the diaphragm on this carburetor, also that door. Oh, it's all right now. That opens up to let the air into the secondaries. So it felt a bit stiff. Um, yeah, so I'll pop the air cleaner off and yeah, we'll, we'll have a look. I've also got to pop the dizzy out and just I'll prime the oil pump again. It probably doesn't need it, but I'll do it anyway. Well, that's checked out. Um, we've got a little bit of oil in there, that's cool. Look at that, that's from plating them. Um, the guy that did them didn't cap it off, although I don't think he could have, but it was getting inside the chamber there, so I need a pair of those. This sender down here, um, it's measuring 250 ohms and it doesn't work on the dash. This gunk down there, is that snail crap? Um, and I've changed it, well, I, I measured that one there as well, that's off the running stand. And they're both measuring 250 ohms, so I think that's the wrong one. Harvey gave me the resistances and I wrote them down, but I don't know. I've changed a bit of cardboard since then and forgot to try and throw them over. It looks a bit cleaner, doesn't it? So, I think we're good. I will, um, when I start it, I'll attach a multimeter just so I can read the um, oil pressure. And I'll just stick it on the windshield so that when we go for our first little drive up the driveway, we know we're getting oil pressure. Which you can normally hear anyway, but for now, um, I think we'll pull the distributor out. I don't trust this diaphragm, I'm just going to unplug it, oh god, from that carburetor. Gee, that was tough, and just put a little blank over it. Um, and just on the off chance it starts swallowing a whole lot of scale, I don't want that in case it blocks things up. So I'll just pop that there for now. And we'll take this out. Right. I'm just going to mark where this was. Um, this is a distributor from a 302 XB, um, one of the ones that we had at the school. And it's incorrect for this. All 5.8 litre cars had an electronic one with a box mounted down there. When I made this loom up or redid it, I um, decided to omit that wiring. I took it out. Uh, I want to get a, a non-genuine distributor at least something. I like the genuine Dizzy but the XW's got one but it's American so it's got a um, electronics igniter in it but you can't get them for these. These are Aussie distributors. Um, and So it's running points which you do for now but I want to get an electronic one but I don't want one with an external box on the side or anything. I just want one all in one sort of unit which is kind of tricky because most of the ones you see advertised are from China, I think, and I don't want one of those ones. I want something, a good brand, but I also want to take it off as soon as I get it to an ignition place and get it recurved to suit the um, camshaft this car's got. So we'll just get a drive in there. Judging by um, the wear on this, I think it's this one. No, it is the blue one. It's the one there. I think it's the blue cap. Good. All right. Um, this needs charging, I think. Hang on. Oh, no, we're on three bars. That's not terrible. Got oil pressure already. Yep, it's all gargling away and looking good. I'll just get a torch and have a look to make sure there's lots of oil going around in the top end. That's actually really good. Yeah, that's doing what it should. Look, it probably wasn't even worth doing that. But, better be safe than sorry. And, um, you know, that sort of guarantees that you've got oil in your bearings and that sort of stuff. Particularly if you haven't run the thing for ages. That's a good tool. It doesn't belong to me. It's my brother's. It's an ARP tool. 
and it came of course with the other type which is probably I don't know what that is maybe a small block shave or something um, and this has an AIP oil pump drive and all sorts of stuff in it I love the Fords for that because they don't they're not the Holden V8s and Rover ones you need to prime the oil pump where these being internal you don't need to there it is sweet all right, well, we'll put it back and see if she starts. I made this engine colour up. Um, I didn't like the, the Ford Blues that they sell in rattle cans. This is air dry enamel. Where are we going? And um, I made it up. I got the original Ford Blue and I added some black and something else to it, I can't remember, and came up with this colour. It was as close as I thought was right. Um, I sent a sample of it to John Parnas. He, he, he's got a, a car that he wanted to I think paint the engine on or something. But he never said anything about it. I don't think he thought it was the right colour, but I'm very happy with it. Oh, hang on. I'm nervous about that bloody line, that steering line. Um, it does look just a tiny bit gross. <laughs> anyway. Um. Yeah, it's going to rain, it's getting dark. The camera doesn't show how dark it is. Um, there's an hour left, I think, and then we're into darkness. So I think I might yank this out tomorrow. I would quite have liked to use this handbrake cable. All the, um, that's going to fall. All of the cable is actually in great condition. That's the only sheath that was jammed. The other two down yonder are fine. There's kinks in it because I was wrapping it around a tree and trying to free this up, but I've actually broken the ferrule off the bottom um, and it's sort of rested down the base. But <clears throat> this was off the fair lane and I know there's going to be people who don't agree with me, but it was. I took it off and I took the other bits and pieces too, including that lever. And the fair lane used a different handbrake. It's like a foot handbrake uh, with a ratchet release sort of thing on the dash. And when I pulled that out, it left the right um, receptacle for the normal t-shaped handbrake so there's you know odds and ends like that i do have to get and also have a shorter um threaded section the same like hoop for it to catch the cable and then the thread goes the cable trapped underneath that's all different oh well that's the same but those two bits are different i also need to get a spring i've just realized i don't have a spring so i might have to order a new cable i've broken that one which is a bit of a shame but I sort of pulled it from the wrong area, I made a mistake. So we're just sort of, just loose ends. Once that handbrake's on, all underneath the car's finished. I've got to realign the boot lid. You can see there, it's a huge gap and it's not right, but I just sort of stuck it there after I painted it to let it dry. And so it's got to be wet sand and buffed and I've got to get the, the what do you call them, the trim clips. Um, Rest Bears didn't know what they were, they've only got up to XY. All the XABC stuff wasn't in kit, so the guy didn't know what the trim clips were, which I, I kind of thought was a bit, eh, you know, I, I, I thought that was a bit weak, but yeah, maybe it's just the way it is. There's a lot of different clips on these cars, so it could, could be my fault. And the C-pill events, haven't put those in yet. Um, but yeah, it's all good. There's some mowers up there, if you like mowers. So even though a new one's gonna look nicer with all new you know, ends and all this sort of stuff. I don't like willy-nilly replacing everything with new if there's nothing wrong with the old stuff. I'd sooner use a genuine part. For a start, it's going to probably last longer and fit better. But in this case, I don't think I can do much about it. I think we're just going to have to bite the bullet and drop 200 bucks on a new one. Going, Rosie? Yeah. Okay. Bye bye, bye, -bye dear. Yeah. Don't be too late. Yeah. 
getting up there. Some idiot didn't put two and three plug around the wrong way or plug lead. Oh. All right, let's start him up. So this time it's run under its own power. We're just going to need sorting out and also it would help if I had a bloody handbrake. Well, I know she runs under her own steam. That's actually a really good thing. And you know what I've forgotten? And I don't know where I'm going to get them. I'll figure out though. Sun visors. <laughs> I haven't got any. I don't like the gate, that's too easy to put, that's reverse. Look at that turns around, and that's first there. It's gonna be an easy car to drive. But I actually haven't even set up the car ready yet. So it's nice to um, to know that this is fine, and um, well, at driveway speed, at walking speed, 
and it's really nice to feel a, a warm engine that's really warm um everything's doing what it's supposed to do uh, lots and lots of cranking to get fuel up to the carburetor which mm, there could be a dodgy fuel pump i don't know but i haven't run it for such a long time and i thought i had and i just haven't i have to get a battery for it too because i've had to undo that loom tie to reach the opposite side that should have a terminal on the inside there and i've damaged that paint just there with the battery and the terminal being against there but i don't care i can touch that up so i've got to put these headlight brackets on and again that's a bit of a challenge in itself because i cut bits out of the firewall and welded new ones in because of the clown that had it before there were holes everywhere again and this xd falcon power steering line cooler um, my return line um, that might not be suitable i might have to have a sharper elbow there to clear the headlight bracket but on the whole it's all good right we're back on looking at the guards now i didn't expect graham to be working so hard on them at the moment i knew he was working in a different shop and getting different bits and pieces uh done including including customers cars uh incredible what he's done um and look we can all bog things over but yeah this is just so much a high quality job and it really is fitting for the car as well and just watching it work it, it always comes across as a lot easier than what it actually is so i'm very very happy that i've sent them to him because i'm extremely happy with the work he's done so far he's even tried some of the acrylic on the uh, two-pack high fill and it seemed to stay fine righty chaps i have file finished out that dent or as least good i can as good as my skills allow me to so that was all in this mid-region while bare metaling it i've literally just thrown etch on it I did find there's a few more ripples back here, which I'm not at all surprised at. And um, spent ages getting all the acrylic paint off this guard, so it's not looking... If you look carefully, yeah, you can see the ripples are just here, which is further back from where the, the main damage was. I think that's not too bad, realistically. We, this is just the first coat of etch and some minor bodywork just to get it right we've still got to tackle that uh fix that issue there's a little dent here a few odds and ends there's actually a ripple here in the wheel arch so that must have been part of the big whack that was through here but not too bad next video i'll do something with this boot lid um sorry i've got to squeeze past it's sort of sitting over like that too much. Gonna to bring it back. Got a wet sand. It got to buff it out. Um, there's a trim that goes along here. What you got to do? Put the lock in, which I've got, and that trim across there, which I've also got. Um, got to do something about the rear bumper. Don't like the rear bumper. John will probably get hold of that at some point. The seatbelt trims. I still haven't done those yet. The car's filthy. It doesn't look dirty, but it is. Um, so it needs a bit of a, a wipe over. And it's just like loads of small stuff. So the seat belts should be back by then, the front ones that are being rewebbed at the moment. Um, so they can go in and some of the interior trims and that sort of stuff. So lots and lots of just bits and pieces. Sun visors I forgot about. Drip rail, rail drip, drip, <laughs> here we go. Drip rail mouldings I've got to put on. And the nostrils on the bonnet, which I put somewhere. I painted them and I don't know where I put them. So lots of odds and ends. And I've also got to sort out that electric window in the back. It lowers but doesn't come up but the motor's working and the wiring's there so it's a switch issue um somebody gave me another switch for the back i'm hoping that fixes it otherwise i might have to get into the front switches again and the bezels that go around them so lots and lots of little tiny bits and pieces if you've enjoyed this there's only a little bit of work that's happened in this one so uh, there's a little bit probably five minutes of stuff i was doing for school at the end of this video just as a side note sort of thing um and until the next time, take good care of yourselves, enjoy classic, and I'll see you soon. Right, so this is a little electronic greenhouse I built for the systems kids at school. It's got a little 1209 thing on it where you dial up the temperature you want. Once the temperature gets there, fan kicks in, cools the little greenhouse down and turns off when that temperature's reached. There's a switch there for an incandescent. And it worked well until, you know, one kid decided to stick this in the mains power and put 240 volts through it and blew it up, uh, exploding the light, the globe, 
It's just a little wedgie. But I don't know what sort of damage it's done elsewhere. Um, so why don't we try and find it? This wine's a bit black. <laughs> and you know what? He was pretty apologetic and he's a year 12 kid. Fortunately, it wasn't in my class though. I wouldn't have liked it if it was in my class. Anyway, I'm just going to bear these guys and see what we got. I should use banana plugs in a bit there. That's what these things are designed for. Um, this is a power supply I made in my electronics days at Box Hill. Um, great power supply. The only thing I don't like about it is it's only one amp. So we've got 10 volts going in. We've got a diddly squat going on there. So it's safe to say it's fried. I'll change out the globe and see where that gets us. Getting out there. I've got another wedgie. This is 5 watts. It's probably too big for this, but... Um, okay, so that works. So it didn't fry up the switch or that thing. So that's good. Now we've got to look at this guy. I wonder if it's frying up the thermistor or the computer fan. Let's pull it apart and have a look. So... I might disconnect him. And take all that off. I don't want to. I'm hoping the thermistor's all right because I don't really feel like replacing it. Oddly enough, there is no physical sign of any damage whatsoever. We could fall find it. It'd take me a while to though because I don't really know what I'm doing with it, but I can't see any damage. No smell, nothing. Uh, what we can do is we can check the integrity of the fan by throwing some voltage down those. I think it's this one here. Are you kidding me? It still freaking works. Fan okay, still works. Tell you what, for 240 volts, this little guy hanging quite well. Oh, well, what I'll do is I'll just unwrap another one. Fears is way of doing it. Before I check the thermistor, I'll just check the resistance between this one at this temperature and that one, and I'll stick my finger on that and see if it changes with heat. But in the moment, for the moment, we're just going to chuck this in. And that should call it quits. Well, that's all sort of plugged in, but I have still got it loose. I've got an ohmmeter, a multimeter. I just want to see what the resistance on the thermistor is. If I can get to, oh, there it is. 14 kilohams. What's this one say? It's at the same temperature, so it should be reasonably similar. 14 kilohams, 14.3. I'll just double check this again. Should be 14.3. I'm pretty sure it was. And if that's the case, this guy goes back to good and it's all fixed. I just have to change the $2 module. Oh, 14.2. Yeah, that's fine. Cool. Let's just screw it back together and see if it works. So, let's see. We'll fit that on and turn that on. we got power. Look at that. It works. So that's measuring 17 degrees. So if I lower this, oh, it's on 28. If I lower the look, it's going up. Then that fan should cut in when I get below 17. There you go. And when you turn that on. All right, so we want to set it. Um, I I'll turn on the fan's cut out now. 18 degrees, set. So I can go 18, set, good, all right. Turn the light on, shut that, and then that should kick in when it hits 18 degrees, which I think it will. Anyway, it's a bit of a digression, but it works, and I'm really happy about it. I am impressed with these. These are from China. These are like three bucks. And the thermistor was all right. The resistance was exactly the same, or pretty much exactly the same. So it's good chance. If you look at where, that's the two power feeds there. So the ground, positive 12, where the heck does that go? It's a matter of tracing where the power what goes. And there's a very good chance, actually. Oh, well, it's still got tape on it, the display. There's a very good chance there's actually nothing wrong with it. I wonder. I wonder if I can fix that. 
Hmm. Anyway, it's worth a look. It might be the little uh, micro that's buggered, and if that's the case, it's not even worth playing with. What do you reckon? Shit, but... Shit, that's fucking...